Chatting with the president and general manager of the Texas Legends, Malcolm Farmer. Uh, Malcolm, appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Jared, any time, you know, when, when you call, um, it's my first priority every <laughs> single time to get back to you immediately. So you ask and you shall receive for better or for worse. Not even my wife has that mentality, so I, I definitely well, hey, appreciate you know, it. Uh, it's, it's a healthy relationship we have. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, I, Malcolm, I, I want to kind of dive into your career and, and how you got to where you are, and, and I'm sure it starts before you got to college, but that's kind of where I'd like to start. You went to Notre Dame, and you spent uh, your time there as the manager of the basketball team and some good teams. Troy Murphy uh, was around, probably the maybe the, the biggest name player. Uh, Mike Bray was there. He's still there. Uh, but I'm curious, uh, when you were in that role, what were some of the things you learned that really influenced you as you've progressed through your career? You know, when I came out of high school, I knew uh, what I wanted to do then is I wanted to be a college basketball coach. And I wasn't good enough to play college basketball at, at a high level. Um, and so I had heard that if you get a chance to be a manager, um, that's something where you can get a lot of experience. And, and if you're not good enough to be a player, I was certainly not that. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I looked at a number of schools, quite frankly, Jared, and uh, the schools that I was looking at were traditional basketball uh, powerhouses, quite frankly. And Notre Dame was not. Uh, at that time, Notre Dame hadn't been to the NCAA tournament in like 10 years. Um, frankly, attendance at, at Notre Dame men's basketball games was not very good. And it was, it was not the, uh, the basketball place to go. Um, and I truly looked at that as this is a great opportunity because I'll be one of the only students who want to jump in and spend every single day, every waking hour working with the basketball program versus you go to a place like Duke and, you know, you're going to be one of 30 freshmen um, trying to, you know, get those experiences. And I was fortunate in that it actually worked out that way. Um, I was able to jump in as a freshman after a a saga of, of trying to get involved and finally was approved to do so. And, and I was able to travel um, on every road trip from day one, was thrown into the fire of um, learning different areas of, of the program immediately. And, and that was truly opportunities that uh, otherwise wouldn't have come to pass at, at other programs. Um, but to answer your, your question, you know, you, you asked what lessons I learned during that time. And if you're you know, any career that you're going to get into, um, at some level, you're starting from the bottom, and you've got to work your way up. And that's when you're a manager, that's really the case. And I, I embraced filming practice every day, you know, cutting those clips down um, for the coaches to make their jobs easier. That was making me better. I embraced, you know, everything from folding towels and having them in the showers. And I was just like, you know what, if, if they're going to be folded towels, they're going to be the best damn folded towels out there. Um, and, and just the embracing of all the little things that go into, um, a program, uh, a, a business, you know, an organization that you, you maybe take for granted when you're uh, later on in your career. And I certainly don't take them for granted because I was the one doing them. You mentioned when you got there and, and when you were considering your, your options, you wanted to get into coaching you wanted to be a college head coach and you you certainly had some of those roles uh right after your time at Notre Dame how much did Mike Bray influence you during your time there there aren't many college coaches who have been around as long as he has Uh, I don't know that he gets the notoriety that some of the other tenured college coaches do but uh, he's certainly up there and I know just in, in interactions I've had with some of his former players I used to work with Tory Jackson in Michigan that uh, most of his players, if not all of them, absolutely adore the guy. I imagine uh, perhaps it was something similar for you. Certainly. Um, I actually, my, my freshman year, I worked with Matt Doherty and, and was able to you know, join some of his coaching staffs later on. But um, after my freshman year, he departed to North Carolina, and Mike Bray came in, and Coach Bray did a fantastic job in a tough spot. Um, he is a coach who truly gives his players the utmost confidence and I'm a huge believer that confidence is a big part of uh, a player's success, but everyone's success. Um, if you if you don't go into a meeting, you don't go into a conversation, if you don't have that confidence, 
um, it's going to be awfully hard to you know, perform at the level that you know you're capable of. And Coach Bray is, is tremendous at building that confidence, giving his players the freedom to uh, take and make shots that, you know, there are some coaches in college basketball who would, you know, never let a player take that shot, much less, you know, the player have the confidence just to step into it and knock it down. And, um, you know, Coach Bray has, you know, taken a, a program that, you know, had, had some success under Denver Phelps, um, had some inter- intermittent success over the years, and has had some consistent success. And he's he's done it by uh, not having, you know, the one-and-done type player, but rather having guys that are staying four years and, and they're getting, they get better. Um, and that's something that, that I really, and during my time at Notre Dame, embraced as well in that, you know, you mentioned Troy Murphy, um, Guys like Troy Murphy, Ryan Humphrey, Matt Carroll, you know, I looked at it as my job of if they wanted to get shots up, if they wanted to get workouts in, if they wanted to get better, I was available 24-7. And if that meant 2 in the morning, um, which was the case frequently with Troy, then so be it. Um, and, and that, you know, building that confidence and then having that success requires a coach to, to give those players the freedom to – to do the things they know they're capable of doing. Um, so Coach Bray's done a fantastic job there at Notre Dame. One of the things I remember about Troy Murphy is he had red rum written on his shoes, if I'm not mistaken. Were you no, responsible for Troy, writing that, yeah, or did he? In the Troy stories, man. I got some stories. <laughs> All right, what's what's the – you can't say that and me not ask. What's the best Troy Murphy story? Oh, come on now. I mean, I'd have to think about which ones are – I mean, look, the um, – the story I'll share is you know, Troy left after his junior year, um, was a heck of a college basketball player. And, you know, he didn't want anyone to know the things that he was working on in his game because he hadn't announced his decision. So, you know, there at Notre Dame, the, the facility there was called the Joy Center at the time. And there's some auxiliary gyms on the upper level of the Joy Center. So, so our season was over. Troy took like two days off because that's just how he is, and we're right back in the gym. And he was like, hey, Malcolm, where can we work out where no one's going to know that we're working out? Where can we work out where no one's going to see that we've taped the NBA three-point line down on the floor and, and hey, I've got this NBA ball that I'm going to start working out with? And so we went up to the uh, auxiliary gyms, and it's this cramped, tiny little gym. It doesn't even have a wood floor. Like, it's one of these, you know, elementary school gym kind of floors. And it must have been three weeks. And we were doing it like two in the morning. And it must have been like three weeks before anyone uh, opened the door to that gym besides us and saw that there's all this tape on the ground in the, in the NBA line. What's this? And then all of a sudden I got a call and a question as to, hey, is Troy, uh, is Troy likely gone? And I'm like, yeah, I'd probably leave that way. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Troy was a heck of a work ethic and – um you know, he's, he was a character, and one that I would say he knows and knew um, his own. He, he knew his place, and this is gonna. I, I tell I told this story to Legends Partners. You know, knowing and our players for that matter, knowing the place that basketball has. You know, he he told me one time. You know, I'm this goofy looking guy. I. You know, I, I'm smart. I, I, can, I can do good in school, but it's not my focus. You know, I'm kind of a dork. I don't drink. You know, all these things. And everybody loves me. And all that I'm able to do is put this round ball in this round hoop. And he understood that that's all it was. And, and frankly, that, that was a refreshing point of view um, when you're, you know, some athletes look at it like, you know, this is the end-all, be-all. You know, this is what I do is extremely important. Troy understood that I'm playing a game. I take a round ball and I put it in a round hoop, and because I can do that at a very high level, I'm afforded all these opportunities. And he literally told me that, you know, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm not going to be, you know, a firefighter or any of these things. All those people are doing work that is, frankly, much more impactful and meaningful than what I do. I put a round ball through a round goal. It didn't mean that he wasn't going to continue to do it, because it gave him a heck of a platform with which to go do other things. But it was very refreshing as a college sophomore, no less, to have some, to, to know someone who, who really understood in the grand scheme of things 
what it was he was doing. Um, and it doesn't mean that it wasn't important to him. It just meant that he understood that if I don't use this for a higher purpose, if I don't use my ability to do this to help other people, then literally all I ever have done is put a round ball through a round goal. That's an interesting story. And, and I remember, you know, like I said, I remember the Red Rum stuff. I remember watching him. Uh, I, I remember watching him play first with the Warriors, and I think he ended his career with the Mavericks with a few stops in between. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. I think I saw an article recently and I don't know how much you still keep up with him, but he ended up going to uh, Columbia Business School or, or right. grad school yeah. at Columbia. So I guess you're right, a, a, a bright guy who uh, really kind of understood uh, himself and, and the world around him. Yeah, he, uh, you know, just, and then, I don't know if Notre Dame would want me to tell the story, but frankly, the, uh, he was gone from Notre Dame long enough that he had to, if he'd gone back to Notre Dame to retake his classes, he was going to have to take more classes like retake credits that he'd already earned um, because you have to, in Notre Dame, whatever their graduation requirements are, you have to earn X percentage within the last X number of years. And so he looked at it and he's like, well, I'm only, you know, really X number of credits away if I can find a school that'll take all the classes I've already taken. Um, and, you know, and so he, he, he figured it out and went to Columbia, which is a heck of a school unto itself, and graduated from there. Um, and he's actually got a program now. I texted him just a couple of weeks ago, um, where he's helping you know young professionals and, and and young people learn financial advising and learn how to invest their money um, and understand how money can grow. And I was like, that's that's the person that Troy is. He wanted to use his platform, you know, to yes, he he's a fun loving guy. He wants to have fun. He enjoyed basketball. He loved it. But he wanted to be able to do other things, too. And he spent his time figuring out ways to accomplish that. All right, now, after Notre Dame, you spent time at Western Illinois, Florida Atlantic, and then you came to the Metroplex uh, at SMU, and I think you spent about three years at, at SMU. Uh, what, what stood out to you about your time actually pursuing what you set out to pursue when you were looking at Notre Dame and when you got to Notre Dame, and that's that's college coaching. You, you had the opportunity as a non-student to be around these programs and uh, even had assistant coaching responsibilities. So so what stood out to you and, and what what's really significant about that period of your life? I know it's a, it's a lot of years and, and yeah. uh, probably can't be boiled down to just one question and answer, but what were some of the highlights of that and, and what influenced you? Um. Each one of those stops, Western Illinois, I was a graduate assistant. Uh, Florida Atlantic, I was a director of basketball operations. And at SMU, I was a director of basketball operations and an assistant coach. And, and certainly I was pursuing that goal of, you know, trying to become a head coach. And um, it was really enlightening to see the different levels of college basketball. Having been at Notre Dame, which is certainly uh, a, high, a high major to use the college lexicon. Um, and then, you know, frankly... Western Illinois is, is more of a low major. Florida Atlantic aspires to, you know, be a mid-major. Um, and SMU is probably more of a traditional mid-major. Um, it's certainly aspiring to become a high major in certain areas. But, you know, to see the different levels and to understand, and this is something that I've applied in everything I've done since, that just because we don't have the budget or we're at a low major school doesn't mean we're not trying to accomplish high major things. You know, it means that we have to get more creative, more resourceful to accomplish those things. We may not be able to just flip a switch like you can at a high major and have charter planes sitting there ready to go. But it doesn't mean that we can't do those things either. It's just we have to get more creative to get to the end result. Um, And that was something that was a, a good lesson for me. And, you know, I learned, as a lot of people do, I think the, the stats would be that most people change careers, if you will, three or four times, at least during the course of their professional lives. And you know, I, I learned things that I really enjoyed about college basketball, and I learned things that I didn't, I really didn't enjoy. And it gave me a perspective of, you know, maybe being a head coach, having that corner office or whatever it might be, and running a program, maybe that's not the end-all, be-all for me. Maybe there's something else that I want to pursue and go do. 
Um, and so it opened my eyes to, you know, other opportunities. And uh, when I departed SMU, the legends were literally um, still an idea. And didn't, we didn't have a team name. Um, Donnie had acquired the franchise license but hadn't announced the team or anything like that. And um, a, a, a mutual friend um, who knew me from my time at SMU and my work with some of the players there, he literally called me up on a Saturday morning. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I got some time. What do you need? And, and he said, um, meet me at SMU and then follow me. And um, I, I won't say his – well, his name was Amadou Gallo Fall, who's now running NBA Africa. Um, and I'll say Gallo could – you know, he had a heavy foot. So he told, you get to SMU and he says, follow me. And I swear he's going like 80 down the toll room. I'm like, this dude, where the heck are we going? <laughs> I knew Gallo well, but I'm like, what the heck? Whatever. I'll just I'm gonna try to keep up. So we pulled into a Starbucks and um, he – he said, hey, Malcolm, meet Donnie Nelson, and, and Donnie, uh, meet Malcolm. Um, Donnie, with the project that you have going on, you're going to need someone with Malcolm's strengths. Um, and Malcolm, Donnie's going to need somebody with your strengths. So um, I'll see you guys later. And he left. And that was my, my introduction to Donnie and my introduction to uh, the Legends, uh, what would become the Legends. And Donnie and I must have sat there for about an hour and, and you know, just – talked about background and you know strengths and weaknesses and and all that kind of stuff and um, i did not get a job right then and there <laughs> you know um it, it took probably another seven or eight months to get a paying job um but in that interim i was i was you know helping out and, and working with the team um even in a volunteer capacity or in, in whatever capacity i needed to to help things move forward when you made that transition, and, and you mentioned switching, you know, people switching careers and, and whatnot, I guess you've had different roles, but you have been able to stay in the basketball world, and, mm-hmm. and I guess that's now, uh, in addition to that, the business side of things. But when you when you left SMU, and, and maybe you realized that you didn't, that being a, a college head coach wasn't the end all be all. Did you have a another specific? goal in mind okay I don't want to be a college head coach I want to be a this or was it more hey I don't know what I want I love basketball and I just want to see where this takes me I was probably a little bit of both I mean I I wanted to stay around basketball if I could um being in an NBA front office was very appealing you know I, I I wouldn't say that I sat there and said well now I want to be an NBA general manager um is that a goal or was that a goal I suppose but I've always looked at it as, you know, let's, let's maximize this role that I currently have in, in this current day. Um, you know, I, I think, yes, it's good to have a goal of being an NBA general manager, but we also have to have the perspective that um, to be an NBA general manager, you know, you basically have to be the equivalent of an NBA all-star. Um, you know, there's, I don't know how many, uh, what is it, about 24 all-stars each year. Um you know, 12 per se, something like that. And you know, there's only 30 NBA general managers, you know, in the entire world. So I, I never really had the perspective of like, this is, I'm going to do whatever I can to become an NBA general manager. I, I rather took the approach always of, I'm going to do whatever I can to maximize the current opportunity that I have and see where that goes. Um, and, you know, it's taken me, you know, through 11 years with the Legends, 10 seasons, but I was with the team of full full calendar year plus some uh, prior to our first game. And, you know, I've really grown to love that. And, and, you know, I've had some NBA opportunities, but um, I'm, I'm here with the legend because I really enjoy that. And I really love what we do on the court and off the court. And, you know, I, I think one of the first things I learned, and, and for people who don't know, I guess now, it's been four years, parts of four years at least. I've I've been involved with the legends on the broadcasting side. I think now just and I want to tell folks that um at the beginning here I said you know whatever Jared calls I immediately call him back. At the beginning that was not the case, and I, I can go pull up phone records and text <laughs> yeah. records showing Jared reaching out many times. So like so uh, looking for an update and uh, it was ironic. So at the beginning I didn't respond to Jared at all. That that's but, you know, <laughs> persistence. You know, into that, Jared, and you can tell people stories of your persistence. <laughs> that uh, that is, I, I didn't know. I wasn't sure. Am I am I going to be doing this or not? But <laughs> I, I've I've loved my time, and, and one of the first things I learned was that 
the legends, and, and this wasn't even coming from people with the legends, so so no bias attached, people outside, uh, and, and really players. I, I think this is where maybe it's most telling, is players who have played for multiple G League teams, and at the time, the D League, had said, hey, this is the spot. You know, every every year I talk to the, the players uh, who are on the roster or in training camp at the media day, and I always ask them why the legends, you know, why... Uh, why are you here? Why are you coming back for another year? And, and they all talk about how this organization, from a player standpoint, is run at a different level than any other. And I think that based on attendance and some of the business uh, elements, it's clear that that's also the case off the court. And, and last year, you guys, uh, I know you're going to you know deflect and, and and say that it's the team, and it, it certainly is. But uh, you're your chief uh, among that winning the franchise of the year. I'm curious what what did that honor mean, and and what what are some of the things that you think you guys as as an organization do that allows you to stand out in that regard? I'll answer the last question first. Um, we're not afraid to fail. Uh, we're not afraid to try something that hasn't been done before, and and sometimes that means that uh, great things happen. And sometimes it can mean that you flop. And in either way, we're okay with it. Um, we don't want to be like every other G League team. We don't want to be like every other sports team, period. Um, we want to be different. And, you know, be it that we're, we're different uh, by wearing a, a charitable jersey every single home game, be it that we're different that there's a, a car that hangs above center court, Um you know, somebody just a couple of weeks ago asked me, you know, do you think that doing these charitably themed jerseys every home game, do you think that hurts your merchandise sales of your replica jerseys? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure that it does. And if, if that's the end-all, be-all, if selling a couple more replica jerseys is what this is all about, then, you know what, I don't want to be part of it. You know, like, you know, we've got Wipeout Kids Cancer is one of the charities that we um, support every year and, and have a night with, and we have a, a, a theme jersey where our players wear it out on the court and away they go. And when you see those kids who have cancer and their families interacting with our players, and you hear from the mom or the dad who says, you know, I haven't been able to come up with an event where my kid was safe, where... We could go out and, as a family and do something where everybody came home that night, given what it is we're battling, and they got a child battling cancer. And that, that's a battle that reverberates throughout the family. I haven't been able to find an event until now where everyone came home with a smile on their face, and we forgot for a period of time. We forgot about everything that's, that's proverbially wrong. We forgot about the, the fight that we're facing. And we could just let our guard down and, and have fun and relax for a little bit. And, and and you hear those stories, you know, when when the kids with cancer go in the locker room before the game and they're part of the pregame talk, and they get to have that moment, and it takes their minds off of everything else that's going on. Um, you can be that positive light for them, whether it's for two minutes or for two years. Like, yeah, that's a whole lot more meaningful than – than how many replica jerseys we sold. Um, and so, you know, like, we're not afraid to try those things. You know, when, when the NBA, uh, I probably shouldn't share this story, but, you know, back when we started doing all these charitably themed jerseys, um, I was in the president's meeting, and, and the NBA is telling us what the rules were going to be on it. And the rule was you could do, uh, I think it was like two of them, okay? Um, and then it became, hey, you can do, you can do six theme jersey nights that are non-Adidas jerseys. At that time, the G League was Adidas, now it's Nike. So I grabbed onto that. We can do six that are non-Adidas. The rest of your nights have to be, you have to wear Adidas jerseys. And honestly, from my time in college, I'd worked equipment, so I knew what was, what was possible. I just wrote that down, and I'm like, you guys just said we have to wear Adidas jerseys for all but six of our games. You didn't say which Adidas jerseys. So I just went and ordered a bunch of Adidas jerseys. And then the NBA was like, so hang on a minute. We said you could only do six of these things. No, you said you could do six non-Adidas jerseys. So I'm doing every other game. They're going to be charitably themed, and they're going to be in Adidas jerseys. So we're good. 
And they're like, well, no, that's how we met. I'm like, well, that's what you said, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what they meant was you have to wear your regular Adidas jerseys every other game. But, hey, you know, we, we weren't afraid of it. We went out there and we did it. And it's cool. It's different. Um, and literally everything that we do, that's the biggest thing, is that we're not afraid to try it. And it may work and it may fail, but we're not afraid to try it. I want to. So I don't remember your other question, Sheridan. I'll leave it at that. No, no, no. They, uh, I, I got, I got a lot more. We're, we're probably gonna have to do a, a part two to this. I, I, <laughs> th- there's one thing I, I want to make sure I ask you, uh, and I, I, I guess one of the things that stood out to me. Just being, and, and and I'm not there on a daily basis. I show up uh, for game days and and you know some events, uh, but just being in the office. And I know that it, you know people listening will say, "Well, it's sports, so this you know it's easy to have fun." But but I think while everyone deals with the stresses and the pressures of delivering and doing their job, I, I I've always been struck by a the amount of people who are there year after year after year, the retention, but b how much fun people have. And I think that all goes back to leadership. And I think it's, I don't want to say easier might not be the right word, probably a different set of challenges to lead people who are all making, you know, well into the six figures. And, uh, you know, you, you've got all sorts of money being tossed around, but that's not what, what working in sports is. Uh, you know, I think working in sports, especially uh, at this level, you've got, People who, you know, it's it's their first job and they're making just enough to get by, but they really want to uh, grind and, and get in. And then you've got people who are successful uh, from that standpoint. But I, I, I guess my question is, what are what's important to you about leading people? Also, with the understanding that you're leading people who uh, they're you know, that they've had great success in their career all the way down to people who it's their first professional opportunity and you know they're they're on the low end of the the financial spectrum, and maybe being aware of that when you're when you're leading people. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I've always found that you know whether it's in minor league baseball or, or you know my observation with the G League and, and the Legends, you've got a, a unique set of people working for you uh, in that regard. But it, it's still important to be able to lead them, and, and it it strikes me your ability to lead them in the way that they carry themselves on a daily basis. You know, we do have fun, but we also have a very, very high standard. And um, I, I try to remind myself that we're not going to lower that standard. And we're, we're one of the things that I love about the Legends, and that, frankly, is challenging, I think, elsewhere, and one of the reasons I've, I've wanted to stay with the Legends is that I love having people who who, and we have some of these who've been with the team for seven, eight years, and they literally look at it and they're like, I always wanted to work in sports. I don't think I ever would have gotten the opportunity if not for the Legends interviewing me. And I love giving those opportunities to people who, you know, when you hire them, it's a leap of faith, but that end up being really hard workers who want to be successful, who not only want to be successful personally, want to see the team be successful. And truly look at this as like, this is my, this is my opportunity. I'm being given this, this gift. Um, you know, I look at myself, and if I came along today and was just now leaving SMU as coaching, I, I hope that someone like the Legends would give me a chance. I hope that would be the case. But I'm not as positive that it would be anymore. I think that more and more it's, um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it becomes more and more of what, who do you know, what referral can you get to get into a job for an interview, and, you know, um, I love that we can hire somebody with the legends who has zero experience in sports. I had zero experience on the business side or, or, you know, maybe some from college, but not a lot. But I was given a chance to try this and learn it and grow. I love having the opportunity to take some, somebody who has no experience in this 
and being able to gift them that opportunity. Because I think there's a lot of folks out there who are capable um, of really tremendous things, but for whatever reason can't get their foot in the door. I mean, you look at the NBA level, and if you're going to go and, and get an MBA, a job with an NBA team at any level, you have to have experience. You have to have worked in sports. The number of people they're going to hire who have never had any experience in sports is going to be very few and far between. I love that we don't have to have that same mentality because I, I just think that giving those opportunities to people is really unique, and, and that's probably why people stick around. That's, I think, why um, our people, for the most part, enjoy what they do. That doesn't mean that there aren't times where it's really hard. You know, there's times where we're there till you know, 1 or 2 in the morning, and we're back there at 9 a.m. the next day for another game. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but it means that, you know what, we enjoy that grind. We enjoy that process, um, and we have people who have the character traits to enjoy that. Um, and it's, hopefully you can hear the passion in my voice that, you know, it means a lot when we can bring somebody in who um, couldn't have gotten this opportunity anywhere else. And then they have the success, and whether they stick around or they go somewhere else, I don't, I don't care. I just love that they had the opportunity and they maximized it. You know, um, like Matt Morales was someone who was with us for I forget how many years. He, he, was, he had zero experience in sports. And he wanted to be an NBA scout. He had no experience. Hadn't worked as a manager in college. Had no experience with the college basketball program. But that's what he, you know, he, he came to that conclusion late in his college career. So he didn't have that opportunity. And we gave him a chance. He learned. He grew. He developed. And then a few years later, the Clippers called him and said, hey, we want to bring you out here to, to run this franchise or to do scouting for us. And I'm like, that's, he's not with the Legends anymore, but that's really cool that we were able to help launch his career. 